Hi, welcome to episode 65 of The Chess Files. The answers are out there. I'm James Ede of the Ede Foundation. The Ede Foundation is trying to build communities through chess. And it doesn't matter what country you live in, what doesn't matter what language you speak. If you play chess, you're part of the chess community. And the Ede Foundation can help you get started if you don't know you don't have the resources to get started. You don't know how to get started to form a community wherever you are, wherever you live. It just doesn't matter. Everyone can play chess. So today's episode, the question is, is what's going on at the Marshall Club? Marshall Chess Club in New York is one of the oldest chess clubs in the United States. And um, I've always visited when I'm in New York City. And uh, I wanted to bring somebody on who knows a little bit about it. And it's, his name is Sal Matera. And Sal, welcome to the Chess Files. The answer is right. Nice so, to be here. It's so great that you're, you're willing to come on and tell us a little bit about yourself, about what you're doing now. Um, and so I'm, and my producer always bugs me to ask the, the uh, human interest questions, like where, where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Where are you to live now? And how did you get started in chess? So where'd you grow up? And, Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn. And uh, my last guest was from Brooklyn. So who was? My last guest was from Brooklyn too. Okay. Well, she. So um, I think there's a, a a big connection between Brooklyn and chess for some reason. Why? Well, well, you mean like with people like Jack Collins and Bobby Fischer, for example? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And so is that kind of like leading to the next question? Like you live in New York now, right? Yeah. Actually, I have. Two places. I have a, an apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan because I went to Columbia and loved the neighborhood. Wow. Um, and uh, in 1988, my wife and I bought a house in a little town called High Falls, New York. It's near New Paltz, um, straight up the throughway. Uh, we have a big house here. And uh, particularly with I retired in 2015. And then particularly when uh, the pandemic hit, it was like I did not want to be in New York City at all. Um, right. So we've been up here pretty much full time ever since. Is I'm going to go back to the city, but mostly here. Is that the Hudson Valley? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I got a general sense of where you are. Um, and yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about the pandemic, the pandemic's effect on the Marshall. Um, but you mentioned uh, Jack Collins, and that was the first time that I ever read your name was in the set My Seven Chess Prodigies by Jack Collins. So can you tell me a little bit about what it was like then? um what what the chess world was like uh what was what was it like getting started into the chess world what were your first kind of experiences in chess so a big question um i'll tell you a story to start off with so i, I learned chess um and i always said because of my mother's hair uh she wanted to go to a beautician she took took me to my aunt's house um and left me with my cousin michael um, we had nothing to do. Uh, he brought out this board with strange pieces and said, this is chess. And he taught me the moves. Uh, we played two or three games. Of course, he won every game extremely easily and he was completely bored. And he said, um, if you can set up the pieces, we'll play again. And of course, I did the only thing I could do at that point because I had no idea. I just started crying, uh, which got uh. Me, I was seven years old. So I just got him into terrible trouble. And, you know, everybody beat him up uh, for, you know, upsetting the little kid. Um, and then- it's not the first time someone's cried playing chess. <laughs> this, is true. this is true. But that was when I was crying because I couldn't play. Uh, right. So that was that was a little bit more upsetting. But anyway, what happened is that night, I came, we, my mother and I went home. My father came in and it was around Christmas time and walked in with, uh, I didn't know any of this, walked in with a chess set out of nowhere. He just said, you know, it's probably too much for him. He's too young for this, but I wanted to give it to him. And it was just, it was perfect because it had a little book, chess in 60 minutes. I learned, you know, the, and then I went back and I played my cousin and I beat him up. Um, cool. But, um, so I think after a short period of time, my father in particular realized that I really was interested in the game. He, um, he also loved Greenwich Village. So we went to a place called Peter's Peter's Backyard, uh, which happened to be on West 10th Street between 5th and 6th. And I think you're going to figure out where this is going. Right. Um, so we had a nice steak dinner. We walked uh, up the street to look at the neighborhood. And there was this place, uh, 23 West 10th Street, which had a plaque on it that said Marshall Chess Club. 
Um, my father was not very shy, so he knocked on the door, or rang the buzzer or whatever, and we went inside. And there was, immediately on the left, there was something that used to be called the bridge room. And in there were two people, four people, obviously, but two of the people were Arthur Bisgeyer and Bill Lombardi. And they were playing bridge, not chess. My father asked them if they, what, what he, if they could suggest anybody to teach their son. And I think it was Arthur Bisgeyer said, why don't you call up Chess Review? Gave, them, gave us the phone number, Chess Review. A couple of days later, my father calls up Chess Review, gets Jack Patel, who is the, um, the postal chess person at Chess Review. And he said, um, I have a very close friend called Jack Collins. And my father called him up. Uh, and within, I, I, it was even a half mile, it was a long way. Jack lived on uh, Lenox Road, even though he'd originally been on Hawthorne Street, which is why it was called, his place was called the Hawthorne Chess Club. Right. Moved to Lenox, Lenox Avenue. Um, and we went over there and we sat down and uh, I was absolutely terrified, uh, you know, about this person who was, you know, a tremendous chess player. Um, and he played me a game or two and um, decided he wanted to teach me. Uh, and said to my father, I will teach him. And my father said, how much? And Jack said, nothing. Uh, now, my father was a lower middle class Italian that was not acceptable. Um, mm -hmm. They haggled, they bargained, they went back and forth. And for the princely sum of $3 for a lesson, uh, my father got to at least give Jack some money. Um, now, you have to understand what a lesson was. I would get there at one o'clock. You couldn't get there earlier because Jack slept until 12 every day. Uh -huh. um, I would get my formal lesson. I would learn openings, middle games, end games, go over the games of the great players. That would go for two or three hours. We'd play some speed chess. I'd be drinking Cokes all day, you know, which was my $3 was used up really fast. And, <laughs> and then we would stay. Uh, Ethel would make dinner. And then um, the, the, the boys would start to come in, which would be potentially the Byrne brothers, uh, uh, Bobby, uh, Lombardi, obviously, Anybody, who's who, uh, Raymond Weinstein, the whole crew. Right. So in that day, in those days, that was kind of the beginning for me. Um, Jack taught me, you know, I thought very well. I mean, I think he was a, an excellent teacher. Uh, my first tournament was in 1959, a U.S. Amateur Championship in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And, um, and I still tell Frank Brady this. Um, there was a book stand set up. Uh, and Frank and Ken, Ken, Kenneth Harkness, I think, were the two um, uh, TDs, as well as they had a little book concession stand. And, and, and I bought a book, a very, a very straight, strangely unknown book called Bobby Fisher's Games of Chess. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Um, Maybe not. I don't know. It's OK. So the book, it's, it's hard to get. I got a bunch of them. I actually got two or three of them. Um, what happened was that in, in 58, I think it was 56. Six to 57, somewhere in there, Bobby won the U.S. No, 57 to 58. Bobby wins the, won the U.S. Junior, the, the U.S. Championship at the age right. of 15 um, and qualified to play in the interzonal. What he did is he started working on the book of the 13 games. I think it was a 14, 13 to 14 round tournament, whatever it was. Um, and he annotated all the games and he wrote this little book which I think Jack helped him with tremendously, especially with, you know, the grammar and everything else. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, it's it, it's the first time that Bobby wrote anything. Um, actually, we'll talk about this later. Part of the Marshall Chess Foundation, I actually have the galleys of, uh, of that book. Uh -huh. um, but um, it, it just was... I'm not sure I was going with this other than the fact that I, I, I think that I very early was, you know, around Fisher and various other people. And he always went over to, to Jack's place. Um, so I took I started taking lessons with Jack. Um, I'm sorry. The, I, now, when I was at the U.S. Amateur Championship, the book that I bought from Frank Brady was Bobby Fisher's Games of Chess. Right. So I bought that book from the guy who ultimately wrote the best and most important biographies of Fisher. Right. Um, so um, so. I, Jack very quickly got bought me a membership because we knew we didn't have any money um, to the Marshall Chess Club, which is where it really began for me um, with the Marshall, the you know being around there. Um, I found it fascinating. I just loved it. Um, and one of the things that we played in then, and I'm not, nobody knows what you will know, but I don't. A lot of people don't know is 
the Marshall Chess Club on Tuesday nights had the, uh, they call them the rapid transit tournaments. Uh -huh. um, you know what those were? So basically there was a big bell. Um, and every 10 seconds, the bell would go off. Yeah. And you had to make a move. This was before they had, you know, you know, a lot of chess clocks yeah. and all that. You know who told me about that was George Koltanowski. Did he really? Yes. Yes. He would tell me about ringing the bell. And it was like, uh, you know, that, that was just kind of, you know, really interesting to me that, you know, you could play like that. And, uh, but it must have been uh, just, just, uh, just what you wanted. Uh, you know, being in that environment. Yeah. And whether they rang a bell and forced you to move, it, it just didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I actually, play, I actually played Herman Helms in one of them. Um, mm -hmm. He was close to 90. I was 10, 7, whatever the hell I was. Um, yeah. And he did the classic. Um, this is what the, the, the old pros did in the rapid transit. They would basically, you know, the bell would go off and they would hover for a few seconds and then they would make their move and now you had seven seconds to make your move and they would be all over you yeah yeah I'm sitting here, this is the dean of american chess and i'm a little kid right yeah yeah uh, and he didn't have to do that he was so much better than me it was at that point it was a joke um so anyway i just you know i did the marshal and then we know what happened for a long time in those days is that i don't know why that the players would drift back and forth between the marshal and manhattan sure just randomly um, and the strong players would go to one place, then they would come back to the other, and it was sort of like you know the uh, the ebb and flow of the ocean. Um, I went. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time at the Manhattan. I loved the Manhattan Chess Club. Also, uh, didn't have the character, and it didn't have you know the, that we were always in the same building like the Marshall was. But it was right. it was a good place to play. Um, when, where was it at that point? <sighs> Jim, it was all. It's been all over the place. It was, yeah, I know. I know. I, I can't remember which one. There was one in a. I think it was the Henry Hudson Building, or it was the hotel. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know Walter Shipman was um, the the like the the director of it at, at one point, um, and I think that's where it was. But I get I get very confused, and so uh, I'm, you can't trust my memory of what he told me. But um, I, so let me fast forward then. So many years later, this is maybe 15, 20 years later, I went back to the Marshall. Um, and in, uh, I, I have a feeling that it had something to do with the with the Fisher-Spassky match in 72. So in 73, I played in the Marshall Chess Club Championship and I won. Um, so I was the champion. And you were about 22 at the time? Yep. Yeah, because um, this is the, I know that you, you played and defeated uh, Kramer, George Kramer. Right, right. And uh, this is like one of those guys that I um, only knew through reading about. And George. you actually played him and beat him. So, you know, it just it just is so exciting to me to talk to you about players like that, like Herman Helms. You know, you right. met him. You played right. him. And w did you ever uh, meet and play uh, Edward Lasker? This is a segue, but. I met him, but no, I never played him. Oh, okay. Another guy I, I brought, like, Meet the Masters and stuff like that when I was just getting started in chess. And uh, so he would describe these these um, players that he had known when he was a young man. And, you know, they just came alive from, mm. to me. Um, and then to read about, uh, and that's all I knew because I, I grew up in, the, like, when I started playing chess, it was in a rural western Massachusetts. And um, so I never met anybody until I was an adult. And um, so that age, though, uh, the 60s in New York City, I had been reading about. And so all of these characters, you were one of them. And you got to play all these guys. Would you read Asa Hoffman's book? I did. And I actually had him on my show. And ah. so I have an interview uh, with Asa. And, um, and it was the same feeling. Of course, he was the last gamesman. So he talked about right. you know, backgammon and horse betting and and that sort of thing as well but uh you know and and he was like telling me about sizing people up you know the the thing about it the playing chess on the streets for money was you know you wanted to know that the, you were going to play someone you could beat <laughs> right but in those days you knew who was better than you <laughs> but you know it was interesting when i spoke to asa he said you know i, I said so how'd you hustle you know, I mean, chess is different from backgammon. If you if you somebody beats you in backgammon, you go it's the dice. 
somebody beat you in chess, it took a couple of the games in a row, and you go, the guy's too good. And he said, to his credit, he said he never hid the fact that he was a strong player. So, but he, he, he felt that, you know, if he explained the game to people and, you know, said, you know, this, you should have done this or that, they would keep coming back. Um, so it was kind of a lesson in a sense. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was very cool. for those lessons. That's like your dad thought. Yep. So I think there were a lot of people, you know, you've got all the names. Bernie Zuckerman was, the, was running yeah. around yeah. and, um, I remember going to the Rosalimo chess studio on uh, right. the same street where uh, I think the Queens something, Queens, Lisa Lane's place was right. also, they were all down in the village there, one right, one right. right after the other. Um, and uh, I, I took a lesson from Rosalimo and he made, you know, put up some position and, you know, it was a queen sacrifice. I still remember that. Of course, I couldn't figure it out. Um, yeah, yeah. But he was a character. Uh, and there were all right. these characters around. Um, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and then at the same time, old Goichberg was taking over. So we were all playing in the Henry Hudson Hotel again and uh, and all these things. Um, I played in one tournament there. Really? Yeah. And it, it was like the the visit, you know, and all this, I kind of thought I was hot stuff at the time. And then when I played in that tournament, I realized you know, there are guys my age who are better. And it was like a real, I guess I'm not going to be the next Bobby Fischer moment for me. <laughs> Well, nobody was. Um, <laughs> right. Actually, one of my favorite things at the Henry Hudson was that um, the U.S. Championship was held there. And mm -hmm. I think I was 15 or 16 years old. I was a decent player at that point. Um, but unlike what you have now, which is the DGT boards, there were wall boys. Uh, yeah. And I was a wall boy for, you know, some of Fisher's games, which was just great. You know, I'd sit That's five away yeah. and, yeah. you know, and be sitting there and watching, you know, the, the drama and all that. Uh, and I remember some of the games that, you know, I watched. It was, that was great fun. Uh, and did you know a guy named, uh, became a good friend of mine, Steve Brandwine? Oh, of course I did. Yes. And he was like the, 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 was it the Flea House? The, the, yeah. He was yeah. the Flea House. And then he also was a big player at um, Chess City in the game room. Uh, out there a lot um, right just an amazing character and a very very strong chess player uh, yes. this, uh, this despite the fact he was very self-effacing you know i can't play and blah yeah. blah blah yeah. he was you know any any he, he could play hold his own with the grandmaster uh oh, especially he yeah. chess. He was good, and he was a really smart one of the most most well-read people i've ever met in my life that's exactly the Steve that I knew. It was yeah. all, he, you know, he's always leaving the Mechanics Institute Library with uh, books in his arm and under his arm. And it was like, a, you know, any topic that you, and what Steve liked to do was argue about something. So if you had any topic that you, you thought differently than him, there was a lively conversation that would <laughs> follow. And it wasn't necessarily about chess, but it was also our, before we chess base, you know, I could ask Steve about a tournament or who played what and where. And then he would say, oh, that was Brown in Buenos Aires in 19, whatever. You know, and it was, yeah, he the, was, the, his memory was amazing. Yes. And, yeah. He was quite the resource, quite the good friend. Um, and uh, I'm not alone in saying that. But he, he has told me a little bit. But as you say, he was so self-effacing. He wouldn't let on about who he knew and, and what he had done and all that kind of stuff. And it, um but one of my favorite uh, conversations was with someone else about Steve. And they said that he had, um, that Fisher had come to San Francisco and he had played Blitz with Steve. And he, he and he was at, at one point, he just said, who is this guy? <laughs> he was good. I saw him in the U.S. Open in Boston, 1964. And he was on the top boards for the entire tournament. And people are going, who is this guy? Same right. thing. Who the hell is this guy? Right. Um, and, but I think he just didn't like the pressure of tournament chess. Oh, he had no ambition either. You know. Yeah. yeah. Not only was he self-efficient, but he didn't think it was important to him, and and to to become a as good as he could be as a chess player. Yeah. Um, he was a big loss as a person, uh, not just a chess player. Yes. Yeah. He, um, and like I say, it could be French romantic literature, and he didn't matter what topic it was. He had. An opinion about it. He had read it, and, you know, so yeah. Anyways, I don't want to get sidetracked by Steve because I want to get you back to like winning the Marshall Chess Club when you're that young, 22. You're now a young adult. Uh, you're beating someone with stature like uh, George Kramer. Um, and so, what did you think about your career prospects at that time? Well, 
I think that what happened was that I, I was supposed to graduate Columbia in 1972, but I did not because I was probably smoking too much dope at that point. But I was just just not interested. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I had no idea. He doesn't. <laughs> and then Fisher Fisher played in 72, and all of a sudden, it's not that I was a hot commodity. If you were a chess player, all of a sudden there were things were opening up, and Shelby right. Lyman opened up the, the Shelby Lyman Chess Institute. Yeah. George Kane started teaching, Frank Thornley, myself, Bruce Panolfini, and it was just all of a sudden, you know, we were a bunch of bums and we can make money. Right. Um, so I became a chess professional, which I, which was not just playing, obviously. You don't make any money playing. Um, and that went on from 72 to maybe the late 70s or something. Uh, but in 70, by the time 73 happened, I think I was starting to get better. And it might, I was thinking about this today. might have been because I was just sitting there for five hours a day watching the world championship. Um, and, and you're sitting and looking to the best players of all time and you're not playing over the moves and finishing in five minutes. You're sitting there tr really trying to understand it. And I think I wasn't even aware of it. I think I started to get better. Um, and in 73, I sort of took this jump. It was like, suddenly I was a 2350 player and I was a contender and George Kane and Andy Soltis and all these other people were in the Marshall Chess Club championship, which I won. Um, and then the, the match you're referring to, Jim, was was basically again televised. It was Shelby Lyman uh, trying to you know, get a chess public again with on WNET. So I won that match. And then in 75, I won the Marshall again, and, and, and which was all fine. And then I just sort of went along. I was teaching a lot. I was writing. But in 74... Uh, I started, to, I think I started to get much better. I suddenly became an IM, uh, I started to win tournaments. Um, I played in a, one of my favorite things was the world student Olympics, which we, you know, we had a team that was probably ranked 20th that we had, but we were all young and nobody knew we were actually you know, getting good very fast. Um, and I scored 75%. I beat Sachs and Balashov on back to back. Um, so I was starting to get better. In 75, I made another norm in Birmingham uh, with a lot of very strong field, Tony Miles, all these other people. Um, and then in 76, I won my title in Reykjavik. Um, and then kind of slowed down at that point. Um, I, and in 78, I did make my my one GM norm in a Goichberg tournament. Um, and I still remember, it was like I won the last game. I had to win the last game. And I walked over, I handed my score sheet to Goichberg, and he just looked at me and said, I can't believe you won. I was like, Bill. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks for the book. Not the right thing. Congratulations on what you're supposed to be saying. <laughs> right. Good <laughs> job. Or... <laughs> you know, just give me a break. Um, but, you I know, really I think. I your life. I can't really, believe you won. You know, <laughs> but I think what happened at that point is, I, 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 I've said this to people, I started to get hungry. I was like. It's now six or seven years after Fisher Spassky. I'm only teaching rich people now. The big craze is over. Um, and those are dwindling away because, you know, they're all learning that they're not going to become great chess players. At least the kids are. Um, so I so said, what the hell am I going to do at this point? I can't do this for the rest of my life. Um, so I, very good decision. And maybe the kind of thing that, you know, a chess player does. I just looked at all the possibilities and I said, you know, the, people seem to be talking about these things called computers. Um so I went to Columbia and I back to Columbia and I said, you know, I'd like to, you know, start up again. Uh, and they said, well, you lose X number of credits because you're just doing, you know, you've, you've not been around. You haven't been you know, studying. And I took the last 32 credits all in computer science and math and everything else. And then from then on, I just started to get job after job after job um, and became kind of, you know, a VP and a manager of like $25 million projects and all that. Um, and, you know, afterwards I was sitting there going, well, how the hell did you, how did I do that? I didn't know it. I didn't know the business. I had no idea really. Um, but I think it was the chess skills that came, came through. Um, you know, you know this as well as I do. I mean, you know, it's normal for us to be in a situation where you don't have the answers and you know, everybody thinks you calculate everything. And you and I know that's a joke. Um, right. At some point it's your, it's your skill and what you've learned over time. And you suddenly, you know, you're in a situation you've never been in before, but you make kind of an educated guess. You know, you do do some calculation, but it's more a feel for the whole thing. Um, Intuition based. And, yeah. and that's what and that translated into business. You know, once I knew what the moves were um, of, of that game, uh, I was able to make decisions because the other thing is 
we're very used to making decisions, right? You don't, right. you know, a lot of people, they're terrified. They'll sit there, I have to know everything. Well, guess what? You're not going to know everything. Um, and you have to, at some point, trust your intuition. Um, and I used to walk around and say, you know, all these people be in panic. So they they don't want to make a choice. And I said, look, what's the worst that can happen to the virus? What the hell? Um, but it was the ch- skill sets, I think, of a chess player to, to be able to, to make a decision um, and under time pressure, because you had to, you know, it was again. Always, right. And, and people are not used to that. They haven't been trained to do that. So everybody knew the business better. People knew the business better than I did. They knew the, they knew the technology better than I did. They knew all that other stuff. But I was able to kind of blend the whole thing and make decisions. Um, you know, I really want to just emphasize that point is because it's so it's so true in my life too. You know, I I um, got started because of the Fisher Spassky match. I played my first rated game in 1972. Uh, and I got better fairly quickly. Um, but, uh, when I graduated from college, I, uh, ended up moving to California. I was in, in the New England, uh, before that, uh, to get work. And, you know, the only job when I got hired and I was doing a job that was mindless and, uh, I could play chess and, and, uh, to keep my mind active. But, um, the only job that was hiring was in computer science and computer department. And, you know, I wasn't sure how to spell computers at ER, OR, you know, but I passed the test. And how could I have passed that test? Well, partly was I always loved doing symbolic logic problems. And I kind of approached it like that. Right. But it was the chess skills that I had that, that allowed me to just not be intimidated by this and just do the best I could. And, and they hired me. And um, from that point on, you know, I kept getting promoted because I, I think it was, and I hadn't really thought about it, but I think it was that decision-making skill set that I had learned through chess, as you're talking about. I think how important that was in my career, because, you know, everybody else was losing their heads when the systems were down. Right. And we had to get them back up or, you know, of course, you know, but um, we just, uh, I just was cool. I just knew that, you know, we're going we're gonna to figure out what, why it crashed. But the main thing is to get it restored and operating as quickly as possible. Um, and, you know, just being able to, it's like time pressure doubled, you know, but you're, you're just not as rattled as everyone else is around you. And that helps. That helped a lot. Tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, support and when there were outages going on, um, you know, that's, I think, where the logic kind of, you know, comes in very fast because you sit there and go, okay, so what changed? Right, this thing has been running for like thirty right. days, no problem. What's what changed? And and you know, was there a strange trade? Was there this? Was did somebody do a release last night? By the way, exactly. Back it out. <laughs> get the hell out of there, right? Yeah. But, you, know, you don't sit there and something something's been running great for two years and suddenly it just breaks. Yeah, that doesn't happen. But that's I think the kind of thing that we intuitively know. Right. So, uh, and you just you just hit it with logic. You just and everybody else is panicking. Exactly. And that that, um, is one of the many life lessons that chess teaches you. When I just say when you teach a child chess, you teach them for a lifetime. Uh, These things like when they're young, uh, the confidence they get because they think they must be smart to play chess. And you and I know that's not true, but um, they think it. And so it's that confidence is immediately transferable back into the classroom. And then as an adult, you know, we're, we're applying these the lessons that we knew from chess to real life situations in business. And we're getting compensated for it. You know, it was it's like mind numbing. Compens- <laughs> <laughs> Do you know Norman Weinstein? Do you know of him? I, I, I did not know. I only know of him. Yes. So he's, an, he's he, he and I were like battling all the time for uh, with Andy Soltis and all that. We were juniors and all the way through. Um, I ran into him after a very long hiatus, and he was at Bankers Trust, which I ended up also working at. Um, Norman basically got a job there, knew absolutely nothing, um, I think, about business. I, I have no idea. But he um, he became one of the stellar foreign exchange traders in the world. Um, I mean, if I'm talking serious. I and mean, he made them a lot of money, uh, Bankers Trust. And... Right. He st- also thinks it's it's the chess skills um, that made him do that, uh, and he, 
I mean, to the point where what they did is they said, this guy is so good. They started a whole new business. Was they say to people like you and, me, you and me, well, not like you and me, people with a lot of money saying, okay, you give us a million dollars and, and whatever Norman does in his portfolio, he'll do for you. And, and they will charge you a fee. The guy, I mean, he just, and he's also talking about self-effacing. Norman's another one. It's like, you know, any, anytime he just, doesn't think he's that good. He didn't think he's that good at chess, except he was like an IM and made at least you know one or two GM GM norms. Didn't right. quite get the title. He won international tournaments. The guy was very very good, but he was like, oh, I'm not so good. Blah blah blah. Um, I don't know. But anyway, the point is, someone else in the business world does very very well, uh, and deep down, you know, it has to do with those chess skills um, to just analyze a very complex situation. And a lot of those commodity traders started looking for chess players at some point. They started yes. to hire and in going out and looking for people. And I know like uh, Nick DeFermian. Uh, yep. And Ron Hensley, I think, did extremely well. Right. And, you know, so it, and I think, um, you know, the, once the business is kind of caught on, hey, these grandmasters, they're not just, uh, you know, chess players. Their, their thought process seems to work, especially... Yes. In commodity trading and, and things like that. Yep, um, and technology very much so. And very much so in technology. I, you know, like I said, I didn't know how to spell computer properly, and and it was like not, not very very few years later that I was in charge of things that were, you know, I mean, when if there was an outage, the pressure was intense. Uh, yeah because the amount of money that was involved, every minute it was down. I had vice presidents knocking on my door saying, do you know how much money we're losing every minute? And I was saying, is my time better spent solving the problem or talking to you? Right. <laughs> Stop yelling at me, guys, I need to think. Yeah, right, uh, exactly. But um, you, know, you also had to have some gumption to be able to stand up and tell these guys, who are, you know, they would take macho male to the extreme. And that's what these guys were like uh, in the brokerage industry anyway, is that they, yeah. you know, they, they uh, um, were about intimidation. And uh, you just, you know, you want, let me, let me solve the problem. And that was my chess background. There's yeah. a problem here. Let me solve it. And, uh, and if you're in my way, get out of my way because I will solve it. And pretty pretty quickly, they would give me the space I needed. And uh, if I told them to do something, they would do it. And it was one of those things that was a natural outcome from my chess training, my logic training as well, because I loved symbolic logic. And um, that would have been my major if my college had offered it, but um, they didn't. So um, I think that these skills and chess train, helps train you in ways... I think math and mathematics and, and music also does both the creative and the discipline parts that you need. But chess is such an underexploited way to teach these skill sets to children. I agree. And it's happening more now than it ever has in the past. Like when you and I were growing up, you know, gosh, it's kind of remarkable that your dad and you found the Marshall Club, you know, just walking around. And dumb luck, actually. Right. Not dumb, but you know what I mean. It just it's yeah. it's serendipity. Just yeah. I he yeah. easily could have walked the, the other way on that street. Yes. And we never would have we never would have found the chess club. Right. Um so it's nice. So so do you want to hear should we talk more about the marshal currently, maybe? Yeah, I think so. Um I think I uh, you know, because that was just you were um helping me do walks down memory lane. But let's talk about what first off especially interesting to me is the effects of the pandemic because the Marshall is something that I visited at most times that I go to New York, uh, which used to be every year. But then when the pandemic hit, you know, people just couldn't travel. Right. And uh, so I would imagine the membership was affected. Um, you would have the locals maybe, but still, you know, you were, had to wear masks and maybe you had to shut down at some point. I know the it. mechanics did. And yep. so it was, it, it must've been a real, difficult thing to overcome. Fortunately, you had a, you didn't have to pay rent, but um, it was still a struggle, I'm sure, in many ways. I want you to talk a little bit about that and how you've come out of it and what you're doing now. Um, well, it's kind of interesting because 
I think I rejoined and I became a, on the board. I got on the board in 2019. I retired in 2015. Um, you have to be a, um, uh, a member of the club for two straight years before you can run for the board. I did that. I ran for the board. I got on the board. Um, and then um, position opened up to be in charge of the tournament committee, which is one of the, there are really two, two ways that the marshal makes money. One is the membership dues. Um, yeah. And the other is tournaments, whatever proceeds we get. So, you know, the entry fees minus um, uh, prizes minus staff and whatever's left over is, is profit. Right. Um, when it when when the pandemic hit and I guess or everybody started to become aware of it in March of 2020, um, the president at the time, Noah Chasen, um, interestingly enough, he brought up very quickly. Uh, I think we need to cut the, uh, shut the club down um, and not let any, anybody in. And I was just amazed because uh, I have to give him a lot of credit for having the vision to realize that this was. This was a non-starter to stay open. It was just much too dangerous. Um, right. So the board unanimously voted uh, and said, that's it. And then uh, immediately we all were sitting there going, well, what do we, how do we stay in business? I mean, how do we not, how do we even pay our rent or whatever? Because we, we do, have, there is rent that's paid to the Marshall Chess Club, to the 23 West 10th Street Association. Um, I see. Yes. So, um, and also the decision was made to stop the clock. So if we basically close down the brick, the brick and mortar, um, there was no, uh, why would I charge, how could I charge you your membership dues? What are, what are you paying for? Um, right. uh, so now we're down to like almost nothing. Uh, the expenses are still there. And um, I just kind of looked around and I said, you know, I think we have to do something about on, go, go into online chess. And I, I I met with terrible, with tremendous resistance. You know, there's cheating. You know, so this is a whole other topic, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah right. First time I learned about what, what that was all about. Um, and uh, it took a lot of work. I spoke to the U.S. You know, U.S. Chess. Uh, I called. I actually spoke. To, you know, I had some emails with Ken Ray Regan. Yeah. Uh, I spoke to various people, going, you know, what what do I do? Um, and I learned a tremendous amount about what was going on with computers and you know, trying to d detect cheaters. With um, with computers, I got to say, I just a sidebar. To me, this is the greatest jujitsu of all time. So you you basically people are cheating using computers, and what you do is you use computers to figure out your whether your pattern is becoming very computer like. That's brilliant. Uh, it really is. Um, so you know, and people are saying, well, what are you going to do, me? What am I going to do about cheating? I said, absolutely nothing. I'm going to get on a platform which is dealing with it, and I'm going to go along for the ride. You know, so if chess.com can't deal with it, can't, can't, can't solve the problem, neither can I. I'm not going to build. We learned this from our technology thing. You don't, you don't, you don't build something. Reinvent the wheel. Right? Just, yeah. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Yeah. These guys are. Um, so we did. We started, you know, very. You know, we had online. You know, they, we did the whole thing with the Zoom. You know, one or two cameras and and all that. And I, we didn't make a lot of money, Jim, but you know, we, and we probably made ten to twenty five percent of what we used to make. Yeah. Um, uh, but still, with no membership dues coming in, and this went on for like a year and a half, two years, and then mm -hmm. I'm sorry, and, and and then we finally decided to reopen. Uh, the mandate was you must be vaccinated. You must prove you're vaccinated. Uh, I think initially it was including masks, but that sort of weakened once once the vaccination started to look good, um, look like they were effective. Um, and then at some point we said we are on high level, we're almost a, a members only club. Uh, vaccinated members can come and play in our tournaments. We very slowly started to open up over the board play again. Um, and now we're actually back to a full schedule. Um, and... I also, just as an as a sidebar, I was very, very much in contact with the mechanics. I've been working with yeah. Paul Whitehead and uh, Abel Talamantes. Um, yeah, I thought Abel did a fantastic job in keeping the, the members playing online. Absolutely. Uh, and and Paul's a, you know, a real chess character. I really like Paul. Um, but Abel did a fantastic job along with Judith. Sorry. She, they, um, they kept like the players that would show up for what we call the Tuesday night marathon. And, yeah. you know, you just moved it online. So yeah. you got, you kept the players, the community a lot. I was and, so and proud you of had it. A Twitch stream also, which I yes. used to watch after a while I started to watch with Nick, the, it was the Nick and Paul show. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was great. Uh, yeah. And what, what happened is I spent a lot of time talking to those guys, and um, we came up with a reciprocity agreement, which was that um, uh, if you're a member of the mechanics, you're a member of the marshal. So it meant that, you know, if, if a non-member had to pay 5 or $10 extra, you didn't have to do it. Uh, and that was both for online or if you got on a plane and you came to the Marshall Chess Club and said, I want to play, I couldn't say you're not a member. You're a member and you come in at member price. Um, That's community. And, and That's it went both ways, right? Yes. So you have the two oldest chess clubs in the country who are basically saying, you know, mi casa, su casa. Right, uh, right. That's and good. I think it's a very nice thing. Um, I do too. And and I, I have a lot of respect for, you know, Paul and Nick and all yeah. A Abel and all those people. I, I think the mechanics is a great place to, uh, to play chess. And someday I want to get out there and 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 I don't know about the marathon. Maybe you have a speed tournament or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but if you do, you know, the your money's no good out here. We'll take you around. We'll show you a good time. Sounds good. Yeah. So anyway, that's you know, my feeling is that you know, I went, I came back. I had to deal with the the pandemic. I've I've, I've helped, which is what I said. What, you have to give a little speech about when you ask people to, you know, to vote for you. Uh, and I said, look, chess has given me a tremendous amount. All I want to do is give something back. Um, and and I kind of got, I got lucky. They got lucky because I was in charge of the tournaments and I was able to like, you know, get us to the point where we could establish an online presence and then come out of it. Um, I think the Marshall's a great place. I really, really love it. Um, uh, uh, I think oh, I, you reminded yeah. me, I think I have, let me just see. There we go. That's what the Marshall looks like according to this photo. Is that Frank Marshall in the background? The bust of him? It's his bust. Yeah. It's been there forever. Yeah. 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 And it's actually the home that he lived in that the Marshall. Yeah. Uh, they live on the, I think Frank, Carrie, um, and Frank Jr. lived, I don't, I don't know what floor, they lived up above. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mrs. Marshall would come down every once in a while, and uh, we were the juniors. And 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 her famous thing was, "Don't bang the pieces." <laughs> the kids would be banging away, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's another, uh, a very little known thing which I just learned because um, I go to Chess Cafe, and Alexi Root is there. Uh, uh -huh. and she was talking. She was talking to me about the women's um, U.S. Women's Championship. I didn't know this. The first from 19 late 1930s to um, Maybe about 10 years or more, the U.S. Women's Championship was held at the Marshall Chess Club. And that's because of Carrie Marshall, um, which is great. Um, and shout out to Dr. Alexi Root. Um, you know, she wrote a great book about the, the American uh, US, U.S. Women's Championship. Yeah. Very instructive to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's a very smart lady and she does, yeah. she does a great job. I mean, uh, I did a tiny little bit to help her research actually – Interestingly enough, she said, can you find some of the games from those early U.S. women's championships? Because, I mean, you know as well as I do, we all those games, nothing is in the, in computers anymore. They're not in right. databases. So, yeah. it, you know, she was hoping I could find archives in the Marshall somewhere, but I couldn't. But I helped her a little bit, uh, very little. Um, well, still, yeah, you did what you could because record keeping at the time was kind of hit or miss. Right. Um, um I also mentioned to you earlier that I'm 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 a VP and a board of you know and a governor on the board, but I'm also the president of the Marshall Chess Foundation, which is a different. Entity. Yeah, can you tell me a little bit about that because that was interesting to me. Yeah, so basically, the foundation is um, like any foundation; it's a five hundred one c three. We accept donations uh, and we have we we support programs. Um, so. Some chess in the schools. I'm not chess in the schools, the organization, but we right. know, obviously we, we try to do that, particularly in underprivileged areas. Um, we um, we supply equipment to prisons. Um, we've sent some to Africa. Actually, you were trying to help me at some point with yes. that, uh, and I know you do it also. Yes. Uh, and we're kind of feeling our 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 oats at this point to um, you know we, uh, to, to just start to become on in, on the radar of people that, you know, we're doing good things. Um, and, you know, we, we, we would like your donations tax-free, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing you might find interesting is that um, in 2008, um, 
Joan Fisher, uh, Bobby's sister, I don't know if you've heard of this, gave us 15 boxes full of chess memorabilia. I'm sorry, Bobby Fisher memorabilia. So there are photos. Um, stop this for a second. Photos, game scores, and the game scores are carbon copies because that's all anybody had. That's what we had, yeah. And that's in written in Bobby Fisher's hand. Um, so I've got about 150 games like that, including the game of the century. Um, wow. Uh, lots of photos. Um, correspondence between Bobby and his his mother, his sister, among the three of them. Uh, postcards to Jack, uh, all of these, um, which we call the Fisher Archive. I'm trying to, I'm actually trying to get the World Chess Hall of Fame to uh, consider seriously buying this. Because um, my, my argument is it's 501c3 paying a 501c3, you get the archives, I get to do good, you know, the foundation gets to do good for, you know, with, with the proceeds. Um, so we're trying to do that. The book I was talking about earlier, the um, Bobby Fisher's Games of Chess, this is not mm -hmm. my 60 memorable games. I've right. got handwritten galleys uh, by Bobby uh, and the galleys that were sent back to him by, um, who's the publisher? Same publisher as 60 memorable games. Macmillan, maybe? I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Um, of course, I, my copy is br brutally uh, manhandled. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're um, we have a, a fair amount of money actually that came from Mona Karf. Um, we have to we we finance the Marshall Chess Club Championship every year with her money, um, his money. Uh, it's called the Edward Lasker Memorial, and the idea is that if the prize fund is five thousand dollars, the foundation gives the uh, the club the five thousand dollars and and for for to pay the prizes, and all the entry fees go to the Marshall Chess Club. So it's kind of a win win for everybody. Um, right. And she wants us to keep Edward, she, Mona, she's not alive anymore, but Mona Carf, a seven-time U.S. women's chess champion, right. by the way. I just um, heard about her. Yeah, and, just, you know, and her, her thing was you, you have to have one tournament a year and you have to honor Edward Lasker. So we do. Um, so it's kind of nice. It's, it's very hard to completely separate us, but legally we are complete, we're, we're distinct. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. And that, sure. yeah. Yeah. Um, that's that's a very interesting aspect of um, what you're doing, um, and I'm I'm really at and you know we're, as you said earlier, you know you're just chess meant so much to me uh, growing up, and uh, you know during the teenage angst years, you know I had uh, people that I never knew my uh, grandfathers and um, but um, you know there are people my grandfather's age who were you know talking to me like I was a, an important little person, and um, I think that all of that intergenerational thing made a lot of a big difference to me growing up. And now I'm at a point of giving back. And it sounds like uh, we're at the same stage in our lives now. And all of these things that these activities that the foundation is doing, you know, they're just uh, keep up the good work, Sal. I'm really proud of what you're accomplishing now. Thank you, Jim. I also, I, I see what you're doing and I think it's it's great. Thank you. Okay. Is there any question I, I have to end, but is there any question that I've forgotten to ask you or I should have asked you about? Anything you want to tell the viewers about the Marshall? Uh, it's in the village. Uh, yeah. It's it's not it's hard village, to find. It's in an old townhouse. Um, yeah. We find out, we, we as the board, we hear all the time about you know, it's endless maintenance. It's an old, old building. Oh, yes. It's a yes. very old building. So there's... <laughs> You know, the pipes are bursting every once in a while. Uh, you know, we're trying to. It's silly me saying you don't have any expenses because you own the house. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> One other tidbit: it's like maybe next next time you come to New York City, you know, we, we should we should do something. So I, I found out that um, there's a steakhouse. I very rarely eat steak, but anyway, um, there's a steakhouse in the 30s, 38th Street near Macy's, called Keen Steakhouse. Um, it's famous for like pipes being stuck in the ceiling. Um, it apparently is where is the birthplace of the Marshall Chess Club. Frank Marshall and some of his um, rich cronies used to sit there and, and play chess. And somewhere in there is when some of these rich guys said, Frank, we're going to buy you a building. And that's what they did. That's that's That was the beginning of the Marshall Chess Club. Um, so I've always wanted to go to Keene Steakhouse and 
just sort of absorb yeah. the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, and give a little toast. Yep. Yeah. All right, Sal, I'm going to take you backstage and do my outro, but uh, what a pleasure to spend some time with you. Thank you very much for the invitation, Jim. It was a pleasure. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, that was Sal Montero, and this has been episode 65 of uh, The Chess Files. The answers are out there. Um, so uh, tune in to this. Uh, you can find this on the E Foundation YouTube channel. Just do a search on the E Foundation, and you'll find many videos just like this one, but not all of them quite as you know, good. But uh, I'm a constant, so they got that going for you. But in any case, um, keep playing chess and try wherever you are to build a chess community, wherever you are. Doesn't matter what language you speak, what country you're from. Chess communities can be built anywhere. Thank you for joining.